Hello everyone and welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. I took a gamble and bought a broken 48k off eBay. All I knew was that it booted to a grey screen, so I thought it would make a good repair. It came out of the box looking great. See how white the ZX Spectrum text is? And nothing's rubbed off the faceplate. It's even got all four of its feet. That yellow sticker tells me that it was sold as a 48k, but we won't know what we've got till we open it up. Looks like we've got an issue 6A, and the original expansion memory is still fitted. What's good news is all the capacitors have been replaced. The original caps were blue, but these are black, so that's a win. Interestingly, the Z80 CPU's been replaced and put in a socket. This could be good or bad news depending on how good a job they did. The entire lower memory is also socketed. This is good news for fault finding at least. Turning the board over, we can see the leftover flux from the Z80 replacement. The soldering actually looks okay to me, but that flux will have to be cleaned up. The lower memory is looking a bit mucky as well. Having a closer look, I found that three of the capacitors were rated incorrectly. That's an obvious place to start. For example, C74 is meant to be 4.7 microfarads. Here it is 22, which would affect the 12 volt supply. Alright, time for a confession. I plugged it in and got garbage and spent quite a while trying to figure out why, until I looked at a handy table in this book. Earlier, I'd swapped the Z80 for a spare while messing around. Well, the spare I put in wasn't actually a CPU, it was a PIO device. Oops. Never mind, let's put the Z80 back in and try again. That's a bit more like it. A white border is always a good sign. People always say that so I thought it would be useful to explain why. Let's have a look at this thrilling book and run through the very first lines of code that the Specky runs when you plug it in. This is the startup routine. It first disables the keyboard interrupt, not so interesting to us. It then clears the accumulator which is an 8-bit register within the CPU. Irrelevant but interesting is that it does this by XORing itself with itself which, if you study the truth table, will result in all zeros. We then stick the highest possible memory location into DE registers and jump to line 11CB, where we do something with the B register and then load the value 7 into the accumulator and output it on port FE, which is 254. This is what turns the border white. So, if you see a white border on startup, you know that the CPU is talking to the ROM correctly. Sometimes this specy just started doing this on a garbled screen, which is pretty weird. I'm not trying to load a game, and I'm not even going to try and explain why this is happening. I did also notice that I was able to affect the noise on the screen by touching a RAM chip. You can see how these lines are kind of appearing and disappearing as I press the chip. And I did swap the RAM chips around, and it was still the same chip which did it, as in the second socket in from the left. So I think it's time to take the RAM chips out and take a look underneath. We 
with no lower RAM chips in, this is the screen we got. It doesn't really look right. You can look on YouTube and you can find what it should look like with no lower RAM chips in. So the next thing I tried to do was to disable the upper RAM, which is done by shorting one of these legs to plus 5 volts and then taking another look at what we got on the screen. And it did start to look a bit more like it. If you saw those vertical black lines that appeared for a moment there, that looks a bit closer to what we should be having. With the RAM chips removed, it's really easy to check for continuity. This will tell us if any tracks are broken beneath the sockets. I was really interested in the continuity from the second socket in, because that's the chip which I could touch to affect the noise on the screen. You're looking for continuity on every pin except for the data in and the data out pins. In the end I found that pin 10, which is address line 5, did have continuity from the socket to the left, but not to the sockets to the right hand side. So there must be a broken trace underneath there somewhere, so we're going to have to remove the sockets. This artistic drawing shows you where we're going to look for the broken trace. Quick look with a microscope and I can't see any problems, so we definitely do need to remove the sockets. When removing a socket that you might want to reuse again, you obviously don't want to cut any of the legs, so the best thing is to try and remove as much solder as possible, and then give each pin a little poke and try and get it to be moving free. Use the soldering iron if it's stuck. If you can get all the legs moving free, then it should just drop out. I had one stubborn pin that I couldn't quite get free of solder, so I used the heat gun at the last stage to remove the socket. Unfortunately, removing this socket didn't reveal the broken trace. I still had continuity to the track on the right, but not to pin 10 on the right, so the next socket also needs to come off. Now we can see the issue. I don't have continuity between these two joints, but I do to the trace uh, halfway along. So that's definitely our problem. The first thing I wanted to do was just try and stick it together with a wire, but I made a mess of it. So let's try again with tape. I started by cleaning the area with a scalpel and bending the um, pad back on because it was still attached, just bent up. I then took some new copper tape and tried to cut it down to size. I'm using a surgical scalpel by the way to make these cuts. I then dropped it over the damaged area and just kind of flattened it down with the tweezers. 
chopped a little bit of solder off the end of a reel. You can see the flux in the middle, that's quite cool. And plopped it on top and just heated the trace until the solder melted. It worked really well. A little bit more heat on the tape. And that looks good. Before sewing it back up, I just wanted to quickly put a socket in and test the continuity. So I got a new one because in the end I did damage the old one a bit removing it. And the continuity looked fine. All that was left to do was to solder it back in. One last check of the continuity and then we can pop the RAM chips back in. Drumroll please. Nice. While we're at it, let's do a composite video mod. I thought the keyboard membrane looked alright in this, but it didn't work, there was a few keys not working, so let's take it out and have a look. On the issue 6A, you just have to bend these brass tabs back to get the faceplate off. It's less messy than using the uh, glue, like on the older issues, although it can still be fiddly. Here you can see the damage. I thought it was worth a try to repair, but as it turns out, these things really don't like high temperatures. Just take a look here, the track totally disappears. Never mind, let's put a new membrane in, it'll last longer anyway. And that's it, sorted. This specy cost me about 35 quid plus postage. 
I had to put a new keyboard membrane in, which is seven or eight quid, and three capacitors, which is nothing really. So that's not bad really, I think. I also got two joystick interfaces with it. As a special treat to celebrate, I'm just going to leave Manic Miner to load for the entire four or five minutes. Enjoy!